You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that am. Well, today is going to be a great day. Today is a day that we get to kick back several days after acknowledging that the Packers um, just took out what was considered to be probably the best team in the NFL, the Arizona Cardinals. They're not at risk this week. There's no stress this week. We just get to kick back and watch as other teams lose. And the great thing about it is because the Cardinals got knocked off, even though not everything's going to go our way, even though some teams we want to lose are going to win, nobody has the ability to overtake the Green Bay Packers. Nobody. The best they can do is tie. L.A. is going to beat the Houston Texans. I mean, that's, that's one that even, um, even given the any given Sunday thing, that's one where you could say, you know, L.A. might kind of have a bit of a scare, but they're not going to lose. Fine, they're 7-1 and one after beating a trash team. Cool. Tampa Bay might beat New Orleans. Now, remember, New Orleans has given Tampa Bay some problems. That was the whole parallel between... Green Bay winning the Super Bowl and Tampa winning the Super Bowl is how badly New Orleans just embarrassed Tampa, I think, twice that season. They blew them out week one, and then I think the second time they played was like the exact same score, like 38-3 to or something they beat them. I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's possible they don't win that game. Either way, again, the best Tampa can do is keep pace with the Packers, who are now ahead of Tampa Bay. Dallas can go to 6-1 and if they beat Minnesota, and believe me, there's nothing that could make me happier. Um, I will happily root for Dallas. And if Minnesota wins, oh well. And that's about it, man. I don't want to get too much into these games because I want to save that for the second half. But uh, there's a lot of games we can just kick back and watch and enjoy and just love life. I mean, the, uh, again, I don't want to get too much into it, but Bears 49ers, what a great, great game. Oh, but what if the Bears win? Well, then the 49ers lose. It's a great day. They go to 2-5. and five. As much as I've been saying for years, Kyle Shanahan's overrated. The fact that this guy gets puffed up over and over and over and over and over again, having one winning season, yeah, it annoys me a little bit. Well, it's because he doesn't have the play. Why do we, I don't, let me ask you this question. Kyle Shanahan constantly gets respect despite um, never really doing anything except getting to the NFC championship or winning the NFC championship once is his biggest accomplishment. But the reason that they refuse to take credit away from him, which is a separate question, how did he get it in the first place, other than the media just assumed it, which I think is kind of the real point here, but we'll we'll come back to that. But we can't take it away from Kyle, you know, this, this mysterious credit that was given to him as one of the greatest coaches in history, because he hasn't had a quarterback, right? Jimmy Garoppolo kept getting hurt, so we can't blame him for anything, because sometimes people get injured, like Bosa got hurt for a little bit there. So it's not his fault. And Matt LaFleur can't get any credit because of Aaron Rodgers, which I've already said is silly because Aaron Rodgers has had other coaches who are not as successful. And other great coaches also happen to have pretty good rosters. I don't know that you can find a lot of um, great coaches that came in and and took over terrible rosters and won. Well, that is with the exception of the Green Bay Packers, who had, I think, back-to-back losing seasons when Matt LaFleur took over. But... um, I think Gruden was the only other one I found that, uh, I think Gruden was the only one that took a team with a losing season to a Super Bowl. So he must be the greatest of all time. I, I, the point is though, why do we give coaches awards? Coach of the year? What, why do we bother? What is the point of even giving out that award? Because apparently we only look at a team's roster. You can't be a good coach without a good roster. You can't be a good coach with a good roster because then it's the, the 
the roster that did it for you. What makes a good coach a good coach? I guess I don't understand that. It's not taking a bad team and making it better because Matt LaFleur did that. It's not a lot of wins because Matt LaFleur did that. It's not consistency because this is year three now. It's not about winning big games or difficult games because we've seen that over and over and over again against great coaches, against great teams. Uh, again, seven and three as underdogs. I mean, look, when you go 13 and three two years in a row and you are sitting at, uh, what, seven and one, you don't lose a lot of games. So any scenario you can come up with, the Packers have probably won and overcome it. It's hard to find consistent examples of losses when you almost never lose. So again, I just wonder, what, what is it that makes a great coach? I guess I don't understand. I saw, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive this is clickbait, but I'm, I, just, I saw this pop up in a couple different places. Billy put it in the Facebook group. Um, and it's, uh, did they even say the question here? It got cut off on the picture, but it's, uh, who's the best coach in football, essentially? And they've got Brandon Staley of the Chargers, which I don't, again, I don't really understand why. You got Cliff Kingsbury, who is having the first good year ever. He's kind of doing a Matt LaFleur impression, except he sucked at first, unlike Matt LaFleur. You got Zach Taylor, um, very similar situation, and they're not as good. This is the Bengals. They, he, he came over. I mean, <laughs> it's funny, too, because Zach Taylor was under Matt LaFleur. He's like a mini Matt LaFleur, right? He was the quarterback coach when Matt LaFleur was the offensive coordinator, I believe. Zach Taylor got hired by the Bengals. The Bengals have been terrible. And this year, they're finding success for the first time ever, basically doing the same thing LaFleur and a lot of these guys are doing, kind of getting that offensive system uh, up to speed. You got Mike Vrabel for the Tennessee. I, you know, again, they're, they're doing a good job. They're fine. They're not Packers good, but they're doing all right. You got Mike McCarthy, which is just absolutely hilarious. Because again, it, when you start to think like, what could it be? I mean, you got a lot of young guys that haven't, you know, Brandon Staley, Cliff Kingsbury, Zach Taylor. These guys, they're kind of new, flashy guys. But so is Matt LaFleur. He never got that credit. So that doesn't really make sense. Then you look at Mike McCarthy and you think, well, how does that make any sense? This guy's been around a long time. He's been a laughing stock. He went to Dallas. Dallas has been terrible. Now they're having their first good year and they have a quarterback and they have the wide receivers and the running back. Why would we give Mike McCarthy credit for anything? Isn't it the roster that's doing all the work? Are we really saying Mike McCarthy is such an offensive genius that he turned this team around? The guy that got fired from Green Bay that couldn't make Aaron Rodgers work? I know it's just PFF, and I know that this is just clickbait, but this is what I'm talking about. And, I, and listen, I just got into, again, I'm trying to stay away from Twitter spats, but you got the Arizona Cardinals or the ESPN writer or whatever, I don't know. Again, I don't really know who these people are, but Josh Weinfuss, um, staff writer for ESPN, apparently he writes about the Cardinals. It doesn't say that on his profile, but he's trying to defend himself. But um, injuries limit Cardinals who suffer first loss of the season versus the Packers. And then uh, somebody named Devondre Campbell's burner called him out, which a lot of people have. I did as well. Um, he decided to retweet this one. And it's funny because Devondre Campbell's burner at linebacker A3 laid out the argument of why that this whole thing is nonsense. So he should have just let it go and not have addressed it, but he made himself look dumber. But he says, you need to fix this. Talking about injuries for the Cardinals, the Packers were without, were without three of their starting wide receivers, Pro Bowl left tackle, both starting corners, starting edge rusher, and starting center. He says, A, I don't write about the Packers, which it says you're a staff writer for ESPN. Secondly, I don't write about, I don't, I don't do a podcast about any other team, but I sure talk about them and understand them. And if I don't, I look it up. He says, B, if it wasn't for those injuries, they'd have won. Anybody want to raise their hand and explain why that doesn't make any sense? Are you saying if the Cardinals would have not had injuries, but if the Packers still kept all of their injuries, that you probably would have won? I'll grant you that. Sure, if you had J.J. Watt and DeAndre Hopkins the whole time and Zayvon Collins the whole time, you probably would have been able to pull off a win. Probably, yeah. What does that have to do with anything? Number one, you didn't, so it's a moot point. Number two, if we're giving back... Uh, injured players to the team, then the Packers get theirs back too, in which case I doubt you win the game. Although who knows, because it's a completely different game at that point, different play calls, different game design from beginning to end. And he says, see, I don't write about the Packers. The, the point of me bringing this up is these are the people that write for major publications like ESPN. The guy, I mean, maybe sounds a little overcritical, but he clearly doesn't know Number one, how to do his job. Number two, how to think. And those are summed up perfectly in points A and B, right? 
Point A, do your job, do some research. He says, no, I don't feel like it. Point B, know how to think. Well, if the Packers or if the Cardinals wouldn't have had injuries, then they would have won. That's not that's not how you think properly. And these are the people writing articles. These are the people that are literally voting on coach of the year and things of that nature, which don't make any sense. It's writers who don't know what they're doing. And this is, I think this is the problem with, not to get too far into stuff, but I think we put way too much on college degrees and way too little on competence. I don't think it should matter where you go to school. I would rather have people, and by the way, we have blogs and stuff. I mean, Bleacher Report is like a big old blog that got real, real popular. Not saying that they're very good at their job, but it's not exactly people that have master's degrees in journalism. But you find a guy that looks good in a suit and tie and has a nice haircut and, you know, clean shaven with a, a degree from a prestigious university and you're ESPN. So, oh, I mean, we must have the best of the best. And look at these. He's got a 4.0 from, I don't know what a good journalism school is, but point is the guy's a dummy. And so, yeah, he knows where the period and the comma go. He understands, you know, how to take four important pieces of information and turn it into 4,000 words, which is lovely, except for everybody that has to read it. That's great. He knows how to talk about the nonsense that has nothing to do with anything and makes uh, articles miserable for me to read. It was a cold, blustery Sunday afternoon. The light shimmered off the sidewalk. Dude, dude, listen to me. Shut up. Shut up. I don't care about how the light glimmers off of something. Tell me what you have to tell me so I can get on with my day, dude. I'm busy. This is why social media is popular, by the way, because it's quick, 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 quick. This is why TikTok has already overtaken YouTube because YouTube is long 10-minute videos. TikTok is tick, tick. I mean, literally, it's TikTok, tick, tick. It's, it's, we're moving. We're trying to move here. And you got these archaic places like ESPN hire, using archaic hiring systems like, hey, what kind of a GPA did you get from some prestigious university that says you know where the periods and the commas go? You understand what a noun, verb, adjective, adverb, and all those things are because you're super good at English, except you suck at being a sports writer. And you can't tell me for one second, and I'm not saying there aren't certain bits of information you need, especially given your field, you can't tell me you haven't worked at a job where somebody comes in with a great degree and they don't know what they're doing because they've never done it before. And go figure, going to school for a long time doesn't prepare you for anything. Congratulations on being tens of thousands of dollars in in debt. You're a dummy. You don't know how to do your job. And you learn how to do your job when you start doing the job. Except in Josh's case, where he's presumably been on the job for a while, Um, still doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how Google works, for crying out loud. Apparently, they don't teach you that at uh, Harvard School of Journalism. They don't teach you the Google machine and how to look up if the Packers also have injuries. Now now I'm digging. i got to find out if I'm right about this guy. There you go. A member of the Pro Football Writers of America. So he he did his due diligence and signed up at some thing. Weinfist graduated from Indiana University's Journalism School in 2005, After seven years as a newspaper reporter, he earned a master's of sports journalism from Indiana University in 2012. Did I call it or did I call it? ESPN just wants the prestige. It's a good old boys club. You want in, you got to be the best of the best, which doesn't mean actually best in terms of doing your job. It means you got to make us look good where all our people have master's degrees. The guy has a master's degree and can't Google stuff. I guess in journalism school, they don't give you basic logic courses, you know, like if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. That I mean, anything like that? Have you done anything like that ever? I doubt it. But you know what? Kudos to Josh. He technically did things the right way. If somebody like me wants to actually work real hard, or like a lot of other people who have podcasts, who have blogs, who have all these different things, they work extremely hard. They put in hours and hours and hours of research to write an article, to do a podcast, to do a YouTube video. You look at guys like uh, Bazarisky. The guy has put in hours and hours and hours back in the day putting together highlight videos that get over a million views. He never got a penny for it. He's an idiot. I'm an idiot. These people, we're all stupid. Josh here, he's a genius. He simply went to school, drank some beers, aced a couple classes, and he is a a national reporter for the Arizona Cardinals for ESPN. Average ESPN technical writer earns an estimated $86,140 a year. Dude's doing all right, man. So maybe maybe he's not dumb. He's in now. What does he have to care? You think ESPN's going to come kicking down his door saying, hey, you didn't do enough research? They don't care. ESPN hasn't cared in a long time. 
Have you looked at any of their content? They don't care. What they care about is getting all the big personalities. They're fighting with NFL Network and everything else trying to get the big guys. Then they have the big guys come in and talk football. They don't know. You think the executives at ESPN know anything? They're not fact-checking. They're not, hey, wait a minute, didn't the Packers lose David? Dude, they don't care. Dude, Twitter trending is such a trip at early, early hours. All right, I got to see a picture. Show me a picture. You're lying. Anyways, we don't need to get into that. But um, again, that whole little aside there about Josh mostly just had to do with the fact that we're all banging our head against the door, the wall, whatever, trying to figure out rationally why Matt LaFleur isn't getting the credit that he deserves. And again, if we just look at the source, it kind of explains everything. Who are the gatekeepers that's keeping them out? And also, by the way, the other characteristic that is important of these figureheads on top. And understand, Josh is a small piece of the puzzle. I mean, getting you a master's degree makes you a peon at ESPN. They've got like ex-coaches and players and everything else that are there. Another really big characteristic of making it to that position is ego. And so if you make the declaration that Matt LaFleur is not a good head coach and Kyle Shanahan is a really good coach, that's just the way it is. And even when they eventually back off of that, off of the 49ers thing, which is going to happen after this year because you can't, you can't justify this. They have their quarterback back. He's back. And guess what? They drafted another one too, and they don't know what to do between the two of them. The two quarterbacks combined, they can't put together a winning team. They're two and four. And there's questions about whether they're going to beat the Bears, which is hilarious because the Bears are not good at football. <laughs> But unfortunately for Matt, the only way he gets credit, I, I, I have said in the past, if he wins a Super Bowl, maybe, but why would that change anything? Why would that change anything? Because Aaron Rodgers gets all the credit. The only way Matt LaFleur gets credit is if Aaron Rodgers does, in fact, leave, which fortunately for all of us is starting to look less and less likely. Um, Aaron Rodgers is just having the absolute time of his life. It almost looks like he's falling in love with football all over again. You know what I mean? And maybe, you know, who knows, maybe next offseason he remembers how awesome off the off season is like right now he's remembering how awesome football is and how much you know he talked about the Packers fans and how exciting it was to hear the go pack go chance in Arizona and he loves his team and all that and I believe everything that he's saying but I'm just saying you know I love my life too and then I go on vacation and when vacation's over I'm not usually super stoked about going back to it I'm just saying it's still a good life I do have a good life got a great family got a home now the dog isn't great, but, it, you know, he's fine, I guess. Good job. The podcast is cool and all that, but just have a different feeling about how much you love your life when your vacation ends is all I'm saying. By the way, you can donate to my permanent vacation fund at patreon.com forward slash back underscore daddy. Um, I'm still hoping of a day, um, and I may even plan to do it next year, trying to plan a trip to Florida and kind of thinking about going down the West Coast because I've had two different family members move, that, well, multiple family members, but two groups, I guess, uh, move down to Florida on the West Coast. So might have to just get a little card table and do a thing. But um, let me do a little math here. 730, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to make this official. If we can ever get to a thousand patrons, which I know seems impossible, but let's just, let's just call it a thing. We got 10 years to get there before I'm ready to give up on this dream of quitting my job because I'm getting close to retirement anyways. <laughs> He's like 45 years old. We got another 10 years after that. 738 more patrons based on about how much I get per month now and assuming that the ads on the podcast keep going. We might be about there. And again, you can join for just a buck a month, man. That's all it is. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Check it out. Um, I feel like since I did that, we should take a break. I'm not exactly sure what to do. I hate to lie to you guys, but I kind of feel like I don't want to do PFF right now. We do have a longer week ahead of us, so we can kind of dive into that tomorrow. Plus, not a lot of people listen on Sunday. Saturday and Sunday are slow days, so I don't think we're going to today. I apologize for lying to you, but it is what it is. Anyways, yeah, let's let's go ahead and take a break here. Uh, we'll come back and look through some of these games and maybe call it a day. We'll see how it goes. Take a break, and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls. 
mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the smooth sounds of the, the Packers and stuff. Did I do that right? ASMR or whatever? You just like huff and puff or whatever? I don't know, huff and stuff? What was that thing? General puff and stuff? Something? I'm on to something here, I can feel it. One of those two paths, puff and stuff or ASMR, is going to be big for me. So you can all just get out of my face. See you laughing when I'm captain of the Puffin' Stuff Society, just living the dream. You won't be laughing. I'll be laughing at you trying to knock on the, the gate to my castle trying to get in and be like, psh, right, guys? Anyways, let's, uh, let's get this started. For now, I'll stick to football. We'll see where things lead. Buffalo, Miami, not super interesting. Uh, just a classic case of one of the top teams against one of the bottom teams, you know. Uh, PFF kind of has that as the number two team against the number 28 team. Um, injuries are more heavily in the favor of, I mean, not in the favor of, but more heavily impacting the Dolphins. You got McCourty, Parker, Manns, Brown, Williams, Fuller, Dieter. I'd elaborate on who they are if it mattered, but the point is they're worse and they're more injured and such is, is the life. Now, crazy stuff happens, Miami, Buffalo, whatever, but ultimately this doesn't really impact us. The only reason that you want to see Miami win is, like I've been saying with everything, um, the Packers, and, and this is also why I talk about other teams, the Packers don't play in a vacuum. It's not, you know, like, you know, cross country where you're kind of just trying to beat your own record. And, you know, if you get the fastest time, then you win and it doesn't really matter about it. No, no, you're, you're competing, dude which doesn't even apply to cross-country if you're trying to beat everybody else either because you're also racing against other people. So how fast they run matters. So if the fat, the person that's faster than you twists their ankle, you feel bad for them, but hey, we got a shot here. So that's what we're looking for, Buffalo to twist their ankle. Um, unlikely, but again, it's you know it's one of those divisional things. Would I ever bet on it? No, I, I don't like those types of games. You never know what's going to happen, especially with a 14-point spread. That's just crazy. Now, would I take the under on that because maybe crazy stuff will happen? No, because Buffalo's blown out teams like 40 to nothing twice this year. So I'm not <laughs> not playing that game. Um, Atlanta and Carolina is just hilarious to me. None of these teams matter because they're both bad. But uh, again, I've already talked about it, but um, it's funny to me because Carolina got so much hype for so long and Darnold got so much hype. The Atlanta Falcons, who have been bad for what, four years now they were they were they became bad the same year the Packers became bad and again if you want to this is, this is 
I wish I was making a, this point at a different time when I didn't have to just move off it so quickly. But th- this is a great, another great way of looking at the respect the Green Bay Packers in general are owed. And although partly Brian Gutekunst, because you look at the different trajectory, but also Mark Murphy, because Mark Murphy set this thing in motion. Mark Murphy is the one that, I mean, granted, again, we didn't fire our GM, but it was one of those things. It was time to make a switch and it was amicable, whatever, but it was still going to happen. But also the head coach and everything else. Look at the completely different path. The Packers tore down and rebuilt, whether it was players, coaches, uh, the executive staff or whatever you call them. Top to bottom rebuild and got right back on track in in one year. The Falcons have done what I've been criticizing the Bears for and some other teams like the Vikings for, um, for just trying to stay the course. Granted, the Vikings aren't in full collapse mode, but they're pretty close and they're going to get there eventually because things we've already talked about with their team aging and not adding talent, et cetera, et cetera. But the Falcons were already bottom of the barrel and refused to tear down and rebuild, more or less stayed the course. They kind of did a mini rebuild. They got a new coach. Um and stuff. I think a new GM, so we'll see how it goes. But um, again, it's both. It was the right decision to tear down rebuild. Then they brought in the right people at the right time and revamped the roster and just without missing a beat. Again, look at Atlanta and even people, you know, look at Detroit. Happy with the the tear down rebuild model, but you look at it and go, well, it's going to take time. You look at Atlanta. Well, they, they brought in some new people. It'll take some time. Didn't take the Packers any time. Although nobody cares, again, doesn't really matter. Matt LaFleur, Brian Gutekunst, Mark Murphy, they don't deserve any credit. They suck. Who's going to win? I don't know. Who cares? I'm just going to laugh. Um, Lions, Eagles, we're officially in I want the Lions to start winning games mode, at least for me. I know a lot of fans don't care about this as much as I do. I don't like teams to have really high picks, if, if at all possible. We get the point. They're terrible. I don't want them to go. I mean, well, all right, let me let me re rephrase that. If they're going to get the number one overall pick, I want them to lose all their games. So I guess it, you know, no matter what happens, we're kind of aiming in a certain direction. But if they end up beating the Eagles, I'm not going to be too upset about it. Uh, Detroit's pretty scrappy. And I think if they kind of do what they did last week, which is to pretend that this game is basically the Super Bowl, they got a pretty good shot at beating Philadelphia. Unlike a lot of teams that are terrible, um, Detroit is not just laying down. Most teams, when they realize they're bad, they kind of just go out and, you know, give it your best and lay down and die. Um, this head coach for Detroit is like, no, we're going to play. We're going to be scrappy. We're going to go out and give it everything we got. Uh, again, we'll see if they do that again this week or if, you know, they tried it all and then they lost it. So they're just going to pout about it. But I actually wouldn't be surprised if they beat Philadelphia because, again, they just they just have a lot of heart. Not a lot of talent, but a lot of heart. And if they apply that to Philadelphia, they should win that game. Uh, Philadelphia's three-and-a-half-point favorites, which I get that. Now, to be fair, though, and I've... I, kind of shifting away from this a little bit as far as my obsession with not getting high draft picks. Um, Detroit is so far removed from being a quality team. Um, I don't know that the number one overall pick is going to fix everything. First of all, there's a real good chance they don't end up taking a quarterback. Um, First of all, just the way that things are falling um, right now with the quarterbacks. First of all, well, first, second, third of all, because I've said first of all nine times, Matt Corral has officially overtaken as the number one quarterback in college football. I called that two years ago. Thank you very much. Back when he was literally, (laughs) when he was a backup at Ole Miss, I said he was going to be the number one quarterback. But he's he's currently ninth, and I, I don't know that I would take Matt Corral number one overall just because he plays in such a different system. He's not going to come in and play right away. But it's probably going to be a guy like Kayvon Thibodeau, the pass rusher, which Fine, but but again, let's say he's Bosa. Let's just say he's Joey Bosa, and he's just a dominant force. What does that make the Lions? How much better are the Lions? Do they go, are they playoff contenders because they have one good pass rusher? Compare that to the 49ers who have Bosa. Look at their offensive system. Quarterback, offensive line, running backs, wide receivers. They have zero, I mean, they've literally got, like their best wide receivers, maybe a third stringer. So... I don't want him to get Kayvon Thibodeau, but even if the guy is just an absolute freak, which is certainly not a guarantee, nobody cares. So I guess I'll, I guess I'll leave it alone. I guess I'll root for the Lions to lose. I'm just saying if they don't, I might be okay with that. However, as a prediction, I'm going to go with the Lions, not betting on it because these teams stink too much, but you know, 
Tennessee and the Colts. The Colts are two and a half point favorites. Why am I so confused by this? What is happening right now? Is Derrick Henry hurt? <laughs> Something happened. The, the Titans were favorites until the 27th. And then they've continued to go, uh, let's see, minus one, minus 1.5, minus 2.5. Man, the Titans do have a lot of injuries. I can't even fit it all in one page. Um, but as far as guys that are out, Julio's out, but who cares? He hasn't been that. Is that really why? Because Julio's out? It's the only one. You got Darrington Evans, the backup running back, and uh, Kari Blassingame, the fullback. Okay. Chris Jackson is questionable. I don't even know who that is. Tyre Tart is questionable. I don't know who that is. Kendall Lamb, I don't know who that is, is questionable. Rashawn Evans is questionable. It's weird, man. I don't know. This one's confusing me. I guess it's just kind of they found their rhythm. They went 0-3 to start the season. Uh, and then they beat Miami. Who cares? Then they lost to the Ravens. They beat the Texans. Who cares? They beat the 49ers. Who cares? I mean, the last two games, 31-3 to and 30-18, to yeah, they beat up on them real bad. But they haven't played anybody that matters. And they also have played Tennessee before, and they lost 25-16. to They played Seattle and lost. They played the Rams and lost. The Titans and lost. The Ravens and lost. The only three wins they have are against the Dolphins, Texans, and 49ers, none of which have a winning record. I am so confused. I'm absolutely betting on Tennessee in this game. I know I'm missing something. I'm sure that I'm missing something. And I know the defense for Tennessee is not great. But if we look at Tennessee, who is 5-2, and two, who is 1-3 in a row, um, they lost to the Cardinals week one. I've told you that week one, they had the same week one as us. They also had a really weird game, but they lost to the Jets, which is crazy. But they beat Seattle. Again, they beat the Colts. Uh, they beat the Jaguars. Who cares? But then they beat Buffalo. 34 to 31, and they just beat the Chiefs 27 to 3. I know the Chiefs are kind of falling apart a little bit, but holding the Chiefs to three points is something that I don't know has happened ever for Pat Mahomes. Ever. This is weird. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna assume I'm missing something and I'm gonna probably lose out on this one, but I don't care because that's just weird to me. Uh, Rams, Texans, kind of already talked about that, but um, Rams are gonna win. Are they gonna win by 16? I don't know. If they and the Texans are so bad, and it's not just a matter of like the talent level. Um, you, talent is one thing, coaching and everything else is another thing. Um, the fact that they're getting rid of all their best players, selling them off, is uh, another dynamic. And then finally, you have the dynamic of a team that's just given up completely. The players have given up. Everybody's given up. So the the odds of them beating the Rams, even if the Rams don't show up, is almost zero in my mind. So. Rams are going to get their auto win of the of the season. Bengals are uh, on a five-game winning streak. Oh, wait, no, they lost to the Packers. But otherwise, are on a five-game win streak. Um, you would say that they've beaten only bad teams. They beat the Vikings in overtime, Steelers, who aren't super great, Jacksonville, who's terrible, and barely the Lions they beat. Um, but they also beat Baltimore, although that's kind of becoming a common theme. Every time I look at a team and it's like, yeah, they beat Baltimore, though. It's like, wait, has Baltimore won any games? Apparently, they only lost two. But anyways... They're going up against the Jets, who just came off a 54-13 to loss. <laughs> 32nd ranked offense, 29th ranked defense. Uh, regardless of what you think of Cincinnati at this point, they're probably going to win. Um, not touching the spread, because who knows what's going to happen. But yeah, Cincinnati's going to win that game. Pittsburgh, Cleveland. Cleveland's dealing with a bunch of injuries, and ultimately it doesn't matter. You want to see Cleveland lose just because maybe they're kind of a threat, but if they do, it probably has to do with their injuries, so who cares? But then we come to Chicago and the 49ers, which is where things get fun. My favorite part about this whole thing is the fact that their head coach is not going to be um, allowed to be there because of COVID protocols. The reason I love it is because Bears fans have done a great job of making a lot of excuses this year. They've made excuses for every Packers win. They've made excuses for every Bears loss. It was Andy Dalton's fault. Um, and then once they finally made the switch, which uh, they all wanted to do, bring in Justin Fields, because obviously he's so much better. Justin Fields has been way, way worse than Andy Dalton, not even close. Andy Dalton is heads and tails better than Justin Fields. But of course, they have to make excuses for that. So that's not Andy Dalton's fault. That's not um, Justin Fields' fault. It's uh, head coach Matt Nagy's fault. That's the problem. So then they turned over play calling duties, and everybody was excited, except Justin Fields still looks like garbage. But still, we just stick on the fact that it's 
uh, Matt Nagy's fault. He doesn't know how to game plan, et cetera, et cetera. Now he's completely removed from the situation. And, and the reason I asked on Twitter, do you think Bears fans are excited or upset about this? Um, I'm going to say probably a little bit excited. That is until they lose against the 49ers, if they do. They may not. But either way, it doesn't matter. Because if they lose, again, it's just, it's just another situation where the excuses get taken away. And it's just glorious to keep seeing that. And, and the reason it keeps happening, by the way, is because Bears fans' excuses are not based in raci- rationality. They're making excuses um, that point to the Bears being better than everyone gives them credit for. Justin Fields is better than what people are saying, and the Packers are worse than what people are saying. All of those premises are false. And so all the excuses are going to eventually get stripped away until their ultimate impending, um, you know, sadness, whatever you want to call it, grieving. And so this is just another excuse that is about to be stripped away. Justin Fields is not going to turn into Pat Mahomes now that the ultimate issue to your problems is gone, Matt Nagy. All of the issues are still going to be there. Justin Fields' issues, the wide receivers' issues, the offensive line's issues, the defense's issues, the game planning issues, the play calling issues, they're still going to exist. Ryan Pace is still your GM. Matt Nagy is still your head coach. Everything is still what everything is. Now, on the flip side, let's say the Bears somehow do destroy the 49ers. Let's say they do. It's unlikely because destroy would imply they score a bunch of points, but let's say they do. Let's say Justin Fields has the best game of his career. The reason I love that is because it's going to set them down the wrong path for a long time. Bears fans are going to be so excited because they believe that they found the truth, the reality, the the Rosetta Stone, which I don't even exactly know what that is, but I'm going to pretend that that made sense. They found the ultimate truth, and that is Matt Nagy is the only thing holding us back. We, We all love that stuff. Everybody does. Simple solutions to complex problems. We don't want to have to really dig in and realize we got a huge mess to untangle here. We want to believe there's just one issue, and if we can just snip that off, everything's fixed right? If, if we just trade Jordan Love, then Aaron Rodgers will be happy and we'll st- he'll be our quarterback for the next 50 years and we'll win 900 Super Bowls. If we just go out in free agency and pick up every random scrap piece that's out there, then we'll go on to win a Super Bowl. If we would just draft a defensive tackle to help Kenny Clark, if we would just, if we would just, if we would just, if we would just do that one thing, or if we had just not done that one, if we would just have gotten uh, G- TJ Watt instead of Kevin King, we would have been, you know what I mean? It's always just that one thing that would have fixed everything. We would have won a Super Bowl last year had we had drafted, uh, oh, I forgot the guy's name already, T Higgins instead of Jordan Love. Boy, oh boy, I tell you what. The problem is that's almost never the reality. So um, again, the benefit of being a Packers fan is we just get to kick back and all the stress is on the Bears fans because again, and, and here's the reason why I said that maybe they're not actually going to be happy about this. I don't know if Bears fans actually believe what they're saying. They have to watch Justin Fields. They know what good quarterbacks look like. They know what bad quarterbacks look like. And no matter how much they push that down in the recesses of their mind, they know what they're watching is a bad quarterback. And so they keep fighting Twitter battles and Facebook battles and all these battles trying to push back the haters, the naysayers, Packer fans, and everybody else that's laughing at Justin Fields and suppress that with this one little thing that it's it's sort of the Alamo in their mind that says Matt Nagy's the problem. Now Matt Nagy's not going to be here. The only thing that's going to happen is their last vestige of, of protecting their mind from reality is about to crumble. But again, even if they win, all that's going to do is set them on the wrong path for a long time. They're going to be screaming, get rid of them, get rid of them, fire them, fire them. And if it doesn't happen, they're going to be miserable and angry And they're going to continue to be bad because ultimately, regardless of whether Matt Nagy's the problem or not, if he stays, they're going to be bad. But then, let's say they do end up firing him, whether it's after this week or after this season, they're going to have false hope again. They're going to believe what they saw. They're going to believe that the only reason they beat the 49ers is because Matt Nagy had to stay home and he's just such a cursed human being that when he's on the field, everything is terrible. And when he's gone, everything is great because it's not possible that maybe the Bears just had a good day and the 49ers who have won two games this year um, had a bad day. No, that's not possible. It just proved my premise is true. And so again, they're going to have false hope. They're going to bring in a new coach and that new coach is going to deal with a team that has a bunch of players that don't want to be there. No real super great wide receivers, except maybe Mooney, who's good, not great. You got a terrible offensive line and a really, really uh, below average quarterback. And guess what? You're not going to win a lot of games like that. Not to mention a defense that is continuing to crumble. I mean, it's holding together fairly well, but at the end of the day, again, uh, Keem Hicks is getting old and doesn't want to be there. Uh, Khalil Mack is getting older. 
Eddie Money is massively overrated. Corners are not good, you know, stuff like that. But again, the, the great thing for all of us as Packer fans is we don't really have to care. Um, and the fact that they're playing the 49ers makes it even better because either the Chicago Bears fall to 3-5, and five, which is great. And by the way, the Chicago Bears are 3-4, and four, taking on the 2-4 and four 49ers, and our, uh, the 49ers are favorited to win, which has just got to rub them the wrong way. They have a, um, well, they used to be a top 10 defense until they got beat 38-3 to three by uh, Tampa Bay, which can't really laugh too much. We know how that feels. But they now have the 30th ranked offense and the 14th ranked defense, which, you know, again, I mean, the Bears fans, they're trying so hard to just cling to something, to anything. Justin Fields is going to be fine, and it's just slipping through their fingers. The defense is still elite, and it's slipping through their fingers. Um, they, I mean, they've lost two games already this year by more than 30 points. I mean, not, not lost by, although 38-3 is more than 30 points, but um, 34 points the Rams scored. Uh, 26 points also the Browns scored. Back in 2018, you didn't see teams score more than than uh, 24 points generally at all. And we're not even halfway through the season yet. But they're barely a top half defense at this point. Now granted, the 49ers offense isn't uh, doing the best job in the world, so there's a chance that they can regain that, and then they go up against the Steelers, who are not great. But after that, you got the Ravens. You're going to have to go against the Cardinals. You're going to have to go against the Packers. Even the Vikings are probably going to score some some points. Seahawks with Russ back. Um, they're in danger of not being a top half defense by the end of this season. I mean, forget forget missing the playoffs. You're going to miss the playoffs. Are you going to have, and, and your offense will not be top half, are you going to have a top half defense? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Um, I think you can make a pretty strong case for the Bears, too, just looking at um, where things lie here. First of all, if you look at the Bears' wins and losses, they beat the Bengals, who are a pretty talented team. They beat the Lions, and they beat the Raiders. Again, that was a little fluky because of their situation. But their losses have come against the Rams, who are dominant, the Browns, who are pretty talented, the Packers, who obviously are very good, although Bears fans, you let me know. Did you lose to a good team in the Packers, or did you lose to a bad team? That's up for you to decide. I'm trying to give you a compliment, but we're going to have to admit the Packers are pretty good. So we'll leave that up to you, I guess. And the Tampa Bay, but all of their losses have come against good teams. The Browns are probably the worst team they lost to. But you could almost put it in order of how good these teams are. If you want to say Tampa's number one, fine. So Tampa, Packers, and Rams are the top three, no doubt, that they've played, and they lost to those. After that, I'd say it's probably the Browns and then the Bengals, and then they that's where they started winning was the Bengals and then the Raiders and then the Lions. Um, if we look at the 49ers, though, they're on a four-game losing streak. And granted, these are decent teams, depending on what you think of the Colts, but... Um, Yeah, I mean, they're on a four-game slide. Packers, Seahawks, Cardinals come out of their bye, play the Colts, and lose 30-18. to I don't know, man. I don't know. I mean, in my mind, the 49ers are just going to steamroll the Bears, but if the 49ers' offense is ranked 19th right now, they've scored 18, 10, 21, 28, and 17 since week two. They scored 41 against the Detroit Lions. Since then, the best they've done was against the Packers, 28 points. Otherwise, 17 against the Eagles is embarrassing. 21 against the Seahawks is embarrassing. 10 against the Cardinals is embarrassing. And 18 against the Colts is embarrassing. They've barely, they haven't had 20 points in the last three weeks. Granted, I'm throwing a bye in there. But the last time they got the 20 points was October 3rd, and they got to 21. They have the 19th ranked offense only because of week one when they scored 41 points against the Lions. And their defense, which is another thing they're supposed to be renowned for, 21st. So the Bears are going to have some ability to go up against a team. Obviously, the Buccaneers' defense is better. The Packers' defense is better. Um, The Raiders, they beat. The Lions, they beat. The Browns' defense is better. So they're going to have an opportunity to actually move their offense a little bit and score a couple points, which, you know, will be nice for them. Um, Granted, the the most they've scored ever this year, the Bears I'm talking about, is 24 points. That was against the Lions. So I think they're shooting for maybe 20 you know, they beat the the Raiders scoring 20, so they're hoping for 20. And then again, get that defense going for the Bears, um, hoping to get back into the top half against an offense that's really struggling. You know, you're not playing the Buccaneers or the Packers or whatever. You kind of do a good job, like the Raiders only allowing nine points. So the Bears have a shot. And again, I don't care because I hate the 49ers so much. I mean, it really goes like, again, I, I used to say I didn't care about the Bears, but I'm so annoyed by them this year. They probably annoy me more than anybody else right now. So it would be Bears number one, Vikings number two, and then probably 49ers after that, and then maybe the Lions, but who cares? Although I really do not like the Lions, mostly just because they're so hard for us. They make us look like trash all the time because everybody beats the Lions like they're nothing, and we struggle to beat the Lions. I mean, I guess maybe not this last time, 35 to 17, but 
generally speaking, it's always been a problem. Maybe Matt Stafford was the problem. I don't know. But again, either way, great day. Um, if I had to pick one way or another, I, th- I think the sp- because I'm kind of 50-50 on it, I would be tempted to take the Bears against the spread. Biggest issue I have, though, is that we know what the 49ers can do. We know they have a competent offensive system with a competent offensive play caller that would be able to run the ball quite well. And we know their defense, despite whatever injuries they've got going on, should be able to stop Justin Fields. But again, that's me thinking about the 2020 and 2019 49ers. That's not me looking at the 2-4 and 49ers and all their issues. I don't know. I'm just excited to watch it. Where are they playing? They're playing in Chicago. Yeah, man, I, it's it's all just kind of leaning Chicago in my mind, as, as weird as that sounds, but I don't know. I'm not touching it just because, again, I can't get past the fact of picking the Chicago Bears, who have one of the worst 30th ranked offense in terms of points, 32nd in yards, taking on the 49ers and winning. Um, so I'm just going to leave it alone. But suffice it to say, I, I could see a path where the Bears win this game. And it starts with acknowledging the 49ers are pretty trash this year. (laughs) Haven't won a game since week two. Jaguar-Seahawks is a a really interesting game that I'm excited. That's a three o'clock game. The only reason I'm excited is because we have to play Seattle, and it's going to be with Russell back, and this is without Russell. So we'll see how this goes. But um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get caught up on what the 2021 version of these teams are. And again, I've been saying the Seahawks have been sliding every year for like, I don't know, since I started the podcast, whenever, four years ago, three years ago, two years, five, whatever. I don't know. I should write down the date I started this somewhere so I can remember one of these days. But um, again, understanding 2021 is understanding that the Seattle Seahawks are not a good team. And that includes with Russell Wilson. They're two and five with Russell and Pete Carroll and the whole gang. They beat the Colts, which again, I don't know what the Colts are. Uh, they beat the 49ers, which, you know, whatever. But they lost to the Titans. But it was a close one, 30 to 33. They lost to the Vikings, 17 to 30. Um, they lost to the Rams, which is a tough game. They lost to the Steelers in overtime because they're, uh, I, well, I guess it's not great on either account. They scored 20 points, um, which isn't great, but that is a good defense. But then they allowed 23 points to that terrible um, offense. And then the Saints, which I don't, I think this was Russell Wilson less. Let me check real quick. Yeah, that's with Geno. But point is, I mean, this is this is not a good football team. And if Jacksonville is able to beat Seattle, having won only one game so far this year, that's going to be quite hilarious. Although I do have a side bet at work that says that uh, Urban Meyer doesn't make it the season. I shouldn't have taken the bet, but I just, you know, I don't know. After, after, after what he went through, the fact that he's still there, I think they're going to ride it out the year. So I'm probably going to lose that. But if he loses to uh, Geno Smith and the Seahawks, we're kind of moving in the right direction here. So I'm kind of rooting for Seattle in a weird way. But if Seattle loses, I mean, and, and again, a big thing that I'm starting to recognize is the importance of mentality, I guess. And if you can get a gauge on where their players are at, right? This is the reason, another reason why I'm so confident in the Packers is clearly they are one of the most strong-minded teams in football right now. Um, again, that I've said about Tom Brady, that's the thing that's always made him so good. It's not not uber-athletic or anything like that. It's just that he he never quits. He just keeps coming, and the Packers have been doing that. Um, the point is, though, if, if Seattle loses to the Jaguars, regardless if Russell comes back or how that all works, the fact that they've gone 0-3, the fact that they are 2-5 and and then lost to the Jaguars, and then after being that terrible, you got the Packers and then the Cardinals coming up and realizing that you're going to go from 2-6 and to 2-7 and to 2-8 and to start the season, most likely. Guys aren't going to be playing at their best. Even if Russ is, you know, just, you know, Russell Wilson's Russell Wilson. He's a weird dude, but he's super positive and super optimistic. Um... I don't know that he's going to be able to drag his team out of the mud. You got a bunch of guys that just don't want to be there anymore and are not digging it anymore. Um, I mean, the the old Legion of Boom is barely top half, 31st in yards given up, which is horrific. They're a very bend-don't-break defense. Um, And then 21st-ranked offense. I mean, this whole thing of Russell dragging the team is obviously come and gone, despite bringing in DK Metcalf and whatever else they felt was going to fix the situation. It's obviously not doing it. So um, we'll see how it goes. I do think that um, 
Seattle probably wins the game just because Jacksonville's terrible, but I, I'm not touching it because, again, it's Geno Smith, man. It's Geno Smith and, and, and not much of a team around that. Patriots, Chargers, I kind of just want the Chargers to win because I just don't like the Patriots, and they just won a game by 50-some-odd points. And even though we know the Patriots aren't good, I just don't want them to win. Otherwise, I don't really care about that game. And if the Chargers lose, then fine. Chargers are a good team, and they get knocked down a peg, I'm fine with it. Uh, Washington and Denver, the only reason I want Washington to win is, uh, number one, to knock Denver down a peg. But number two, we beat Washington. And every time you beat a team and everyone's like, yeah, but they're trash, and they go on to stomp another team out, you kind of just give a glance like, oh, yeah? Are they kind of trash, you think? Or are they maybe kind of good? We good at football? I don't know. So hopefully we get one of those moments. Tampa Bay and the Saints, as much as I hate to say it, I'm rooting for the Saints a little bit. I'm scared to do so because my biggest fear is that we play the Saints in the NFC Championship game and lose because that's how that works, right? That's the one team we're not going to be able to beat, and we're going to see them there, and it's going to be horrible. But Tampa Bay is um, kind of the, the media darling right now. It's who everybody loves. It's who everybody says is the best and all that stuff. And if the Saints could knock them down a peg, that would just be great. Um, if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers win, that's also not terrible because the Saints um, would then fall to fall four and three. So that would be a good thing from that standpoint. In fact, if you remove week one, which again, I've done several times because the Packers are just terrible. They lost to the Panthers. They uh, beat New England, who's not great. They lost to the Giants, which is hilarious. Um, they beat the Washington football team and they beat uh, Seattle by three, barely. So it's a very volatile, I mean, it's a very Jameis Winston type of team, I guess. It's kind of like Tampa Bay back when he was in Tampa. Sometimes they blow a team out 52 to 25, and sometimes they lose like 3 to 15 or something ridiculous. But with that said, I do think Tampa's going to end up kind of spanking the Saints a little bit. But again, either way is, is a positive. Uh, we, we take a, a game up on Tampa, which is important. I mean, at, at some point, we're going to be gauging um, how to get that number one seed. We're going to be fighting for that, you know. The fact that we're tied with Arizona and beat Arizona is fantastic because if there were some kind of a tiebreaker, guess what? We win. Um, and if Tampa falls here, um, assuming we're going to lose a game at some point, you need Tampa to start losing some games. You need some of these teams to start losing some games. And so um, we probably should be rooting for the Saints. Again, it just makes me nervous. I think Tampa's going to win. I'm rooting for the Saints reservedly. Um, and then finally... Dallas Cowboys, Minnesota Vikings. We do have Giants Chiefs. Eh, we could talk about Giants Chiefs, I guess. Could save it for tomorrow, but I'll probably forget anyway, so we'll talk about it. But Dallas Cowboys, Minnesota Vikings. I, I, this is the thing I love about this entire week. Every game is every game in which there's a team I care about, they're going up against another team I care about. So either way, somebody's going to lose, and that's awesome. For the same reason that I should be rooting against um, Tampa, we should probably be rooting against Dallas as well. Um, unfortunately, Dallas actually is a threat. They have the number one ranked defense right now, thanks to the Packers knocking off Arizona. Number one in points and number one in yards. Um, they have scored in the last four weeks, 41, 36, 44, and 35, and they're coming off a bye week. They are absolutely annihilating teams. Um, now, granted, it was the Eagles, Panthers, Giants, and Patriots, so not exactly the best teams in the world, especially defenses, but they also scored 29 against the Buccaneers, who have a good defense. Chargers only 20, but you know, you're allowed one down week, I guess. They've also won uh, five in a row after losing barely to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So they, they look like a force to be reckoned with. There's no question about it. I mean, it's a very Mike McCarthy team. Mike McCarthy knows what to do when he has a great quarterback and a great group of wide receivers and a decent enough offensive line. And uh, the defense isn't very good, but it doesn't matter. This is, this is what Mike McCarthy's always needed. Just give me a, a talented quarterback and a bunch of wide receivers done. <laughs> We're back, man. This is old school Packers. 20th ranked defense. You know, I mean, this is, this is, this is the, what, what year would this be? Maybe 2011. Do we have a worse defense in 2011? I feel like we did. Let me check. We actually ended the season 14th in defense. Uh, I don't know where we were at that point in the year. I could look it up, but I just, I guess I don't care that much. And I probably shouldn't give them that much credit to call them the number one. Now I got to look it up because that seems, I don't like doing that. Oh, they're actually ahead of us. The Packers were six and zero. Oh and had scored 197 points in their first six weeks. Dallas has scored 205. Man, that makes me sick. By the way, we also went on to play Minnesota in our week seven. We won 33 to 27, interestingly enough. By the way, a lot of our big wins came later. This was by week six, we had scored 24 and 25. Uh, the week, two weeks before that was 27. So three of our 20 point games came right in that range. We went on to score 33, 45, 45, 35. So we kind of went on a tear. 27 against Detroit, then 38, 46, 
14 against the Chiefs and 35-45. So yeah, we we had some real big games coming up down the stretch. But anyways, yeah, this is this is reminiscent of um, unfortunately, and, and according to this, it was first on offense, 19th on defense. I don't know if that maybe includes the playoffs, whereas the other one didn't. I don't know. But very, very, very similar. 32nd in terms of yards defensively. That old Dom Capers, Ben Don't Break defense. Anyways, point is, that's what we're dealing with here with Dallas. Uh, offensive powerhouse with a skep- with a iffy defense. So I don't know, man. I mean, if, if the Vikings lose and fall to 3-4, and four, that's great. Ultimately, this is our number one concern right now is is Minnesota and, and knocking them down. I mean, the first battle is winning the division. The second battle is is beyond that. So, um, and they are coming off a of bye week also. So they're both coming off a of bye week. That's interesting. Uh, the Vikings have won three of their last four. Uh, they beat Seattle 30 to 17, Detroit 19 to 17, and the Panthers 34 to 28. They lost to Cleveland 7 to 14, which is an embarrassment. Uh, I, I don't know, man. I guess ultimately it's one of those you want them both to play poorly and then whatever. I can't, I can't commit to any. I, I don't want to say I want to see Minnesota win because I don't. I don't want to see them go to four and three, having just knocked off Dallas, coming out of their bye. I don't want to see that. You can be getting all cocky and bragging, but it would be kind of cool. <laughs> and then Dallas, like, I don't want, I mean, again, they're on pace to have a better offense than the 2011 Green Bay Packers. I can't live with that. Mike McCarthy, after all the Packers done under Mike McCarthy's tenure, some of the greatest offenses and teams um, that we've seen, and he's going to go to Dallas and have a better team. I can't live with that. I mean, I guess as long as this is a low-scoring game, I guess Dallas can win. But um, I don't know. Tie would be cool. <laughs> I don't know what to do. But again, the w- winning is the default, so any team that loses is going to be a good thing. I just don't want to see any one of these teams look really, really good. But then if they blow out the other team, that's going to be awesome too. Like if Dallas gets blown out, that's kind of cool. Or if the Vikings get blown out, you got to laugh about it. Anyways, um, finally, and again, Minnesota Minnesota's actually favorites in this game? Now I'm, again, I'm confused. Who's hurting Dallas? Oh, wait, isn't Dak not possibly playing? That's right. It's a game time decision. So maybe, and this isn't a bad solution either, if Dak doesn't play, which I think he will, but if he doesn't play and the Vikings win, the Vikings don't get a ton of credit because who cares? You barely beat a, a Dallas Cowboys team without Dak. And Dallas loses a game that they probably shouldn't have, but guess what? Still shows up on the scorecard. Ha ha, you lose. I'll take that, man. I'll take that all day. I want Dak Prescott to not play and the Vikings to win. There's my final answer. Anyways, finally, I do want to talk a little bit about the Chiefs-Giants um, only because I'm sure the Chiefs are going to win. They're 10-point favorites. Uh, you know. Regardless, though, I am so happy to see Kansas City fall off the way that they are. And and again, I predicted that this would happen. They're drafting terribly. They're an overinflated team based on the talent that they have, et cetera, et cetera. But things are unraveling faster than I could have expected. And the latest on that is the fa- or the, the players are now attacking the fans on social media. Fans are mad at the players because of, you know, how trash they've been. They're lashing out, and players are lashing back, saying, yeah, my first three years we went to... What did he say? Like three AFC championships, won a Super Bowl. Like, dude, what are you complaining about? I feel like you should be more grateful or whatever. Actually, those were my words. But And then Tyron Matthew responded. I think that was Frank Clark the first time. Tyron Matthew responded and said, this is the most toxic fan base in football, which he might be right about. I complain about Packers fans being ungrateful. If Chiefs fans are trashing the Chiefs, that's crazy. But again, talking about the mentality thing, things are just going to spiral. I mean, this is, this is, this is toxicity you, there's sort of this Superman complex. And the first time I acknowledged it was the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers almost had an undefeated season. I think they lost one game in the regular season. So they almost went undefeated, but didn't. Then they kind of cruised their way into the Super Bowl and got embarrassed. And the very next year, they played the first game against the Broncos, who's the team that embarrassed them in the Super Bowl. And what I said was, if they lose to the Broncos, they're going to have a terrible season. Now, remember, this is a pretty big proclamation because this was maybe the best team in football last year the Carolina Panthers were. Cam Newton was just unbelievable that year. The whole team was just unstoppable. I said, if they lose to the Broncos, they're going to be terrible. They lost to the Broncos, and they were terrible that year. Why? Nothing really changed as far as their roster, maybe a little bit of turnover. Why would they be so bad? Because your mentality is so unbelievably important, especially with a guy like Cam, who's extremely emotionally volatile. That team was riding the highest highs ever because they were winning. 
And when you're winning, you have this sort of belief that you're invincible. It, it reminds me of that old 300 line. There's, there's a scene in 300 where, you know, King Xerxes believed he was a god. And so he ruled and did all these things believing that he was some kind of a deity. And, and at one point, King Leonidas throws a spear at him, doesn't kill him, but it grazes his cheek and it draws blood. It, like, you know, scrapes his cheek, but also rips some of his face earrings off or whatever. And you see a little bit of blood. The point of it, though, though, was he proved to him that you can bleed, which proved to you that you're not a god. And it's the second you realize you're not a god, it changes everything. The Chiefs were flying around with a God complex. They were playing way better than they should have because they believed they could, they could beat anybody. The defense, which did not have very good players, believed that they were an elite defense. They all believed these things that weren't even true. It's such a powerful thing. I don't want to get into this whole name it and claim it nonsense, but you get my point. There is some rationale behind that. And once the Chiefs started losing games and losing games big, they realized they weren't invincible. When they got embarrassed in the Super Bowl, they really realized they were not invincible. And this whole year now, it has been playing as a mortal franchise. And then when you're mortal, all the flaws start to come out. As Pat Mahomes starts to doubt himself, he's never had mistakes or problems or whatever in the past. And even when there were um, issues with passes that should have been intercepted and weren't, you kind of just move on because you're, you're the greatest. And the, the media tells you that you're the greatest and everything is just fine and great. Right now, they're three and four, and they lost to the Titans three to 27. Do you know the last time the Kansas City Chiefs only scored three points in a game prior to this game? Not only has Pat Mahomes never scored that few of points, you know the last time it was? December 30th, 2012. It happened five times from 2011 to 2012. It hasn't happened once since December 30th, 2012. Starting in 2013, they have not scored less than three points once. Not once. Pat Mahomes, greatest quarterback of all time, et cetera, et cetera, right? He's so great, amazing. I'm not really disputing it, but I'm just being a little little facetious. But he played in this game, and they only scored three points. Do you know how many times they've scored less than 14 points since Pat Mahomes took over? One other time, 13 to 19 against Indianapolis. In fact, there's only four times other than this game when they've scored less than 21 points. Actually, not less than. That's, that's not even true. They scored 21 exactly one. They scored 20 against Buffalo in 2021 this year, so that's not great. Um, 17 against Atlanta in 2020, and uh, 13 against Indy, as I said, in 2019. So Pat Mahomes has scored 21 or more points. In fact, let me give you an exact number here. 51 times. 51. Only four times. 51 compared to four, where he scored less than 21 points. And only once has it ever been anywhere near this bad. Three to 27. I I just want you to know how monumental that is. Again, you got to go way back through a lot of bad eras of Kansas City. It's not like 2012 was the last time they were bad. There's a big gap between 2012 and 2018 when Pat Mahomes took over, and they didn't score three points once. Three or less. Not a zero, nothing. They didn't score three points or less. Not one time. This is monumental because of what it does to you mentally and emotionally, and the team is unraveling. And now is what now what you're going to find is all the negatives stay big time negatives. And it's not just that the defense is terrible because it is. Pat Mahomes and this offense now have got some serious issues because they're up in their own head and they're realizing they're not immortal. They're realizing they're not the best team in the AFC or the NFL or any of that. They're realizing that they're not favorites and they don't know how they're going to win a lot of these games. And guess what? They're probably not going to be on top. I, I, for the foreseeable future. Because again, the biggest issue that I, out, that I outlined is the fact that once they got rid of Dorsey, they have not drafted well. They're not going to replace this offensive line. They're not going to get new... I mean, uh, stopped clock is right twice a day, right? Eventually you'll hit on a player at some point. But you have to have a, a track record of, of higher than average hits to be able to fully plenish a team. And so, yeah, I fully expect them to have a get-right game against the Giants. I expect them not to just win, but annihilate the Giants. And this is, I said this uh, last time, too, when this happened. What was that? There was a game they got beat up on pretty bad. I said they're going to get right after that. I think it was after Buffalo. I said they'd play Washington and they'd blow them out, and that would be their get-right game because, you know, they're angry, and they're going to come back, and they're going to play a bad team, and they're going to annihilate them. Same thing here. Here's the thing that I'm wondering about, though, because... Again, you lose to Buffalo pretty bad, 20-38, to 38, 
And then you get all mad and we're like, we're better than this. And you just annihilate Washington 31 to 13. I think there was a giant spread on that, probably like 15 points. And I said I would be willing to take the over. I think it was something like that that I said. I was very confident that they wouldn't just win. They would annihilate Washington, and they did. Here's what I'm curious about, though. Now that they're so far in the dumps, and this is this is now the second time in just a handful of, of weeks that we've had to, you know, convince ourselves, no, we're really good. We're going to get them. At some point, you start to realize every time we play good teams, we lose. Every time then we have to get right against trash teams. I wonder if they're going to cover the spread against the Giants. I wonder if they're going to have that sort of, you know, we're really good and we're just going to lay into this team. We're going to score 42 points and we're not going to allow them to score more than 20. All right, we're going to win by 20 points. and It's possible, but it's something to keep an eye on. They should. If the Chiefs are still the Chiefs in any capacity, they should win this by 20 points. If they don't cover the spread, they're in big time trouble because now they don't even have that mentality that says you don't know who you're messing with. That mentality that says we're going to put the boot on the throat of terrible teams and just crush. This is a big game for them because they got the Packers after this week, and the Packers are coming back healthy. This needs to be a statement game, which granted, it's not saying much of a statement because you just had a statement game a couple weeks ago and then lost embarrassingly to the Titans. But it's your only hope at this point. You have to do it. You have to win by 20 to be able to come in with a puffed out chest, puffed out enough to convince yourself, I mean, forget the Packers, forget scaring the Packers, that's probably not going to happen. They're not scared of the Cardinals when they have no players. They're not going to be scared of the Kansas City Chiefs with one of the worst defenses in football and an offense that is now barely top 10, whose only wins have come against the Browns, the Eagles, and the Washington football team, soon to be New York Giants. You're not scaring the Packers. What you need to do this for is to convince your team that you can beat the Packers, convince yourself that you're good enough to actually beat them, which is a crazy thing that I wouldn't have expected at this point in the season, but that's where we're at. Packers are not scared of you. The question is, are you going to be scared of the Packers by the end of this game? You better beat the Giants by 20. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Sunday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.